This is a Hot Pie Media Original. Welcome back to Overcome with Justin Wren. This episode is going to be incredible, I believe, for you. Wherever you are on your healthcare journey, whatever you've had to overcome, me, myself, it's been malaria three times, and it's been black water fever, where it's been uh, parasites and amoebas in my brain and stomach and all sorts of stuff, and uh, celiac and addiction and all this different stuff. But whatever you, wherever you are in your healthcare journey, I think you're going to be encouraged today. Brigham Bueller is one of those outliers. He's a guy that is one, one of my best friends. Two, he's been in the healthcare industry since he was 21 years old. He was trying to help people overcome whatever they're facing through big pharma at first. And then through surgeries and, and working at a big surgery, uh, surgical firm and, and company. He's built companies that have been up to 150 employees, and he's really tried to help change the broken healthcare system, which he calls sick care. They treat you when you're sick. And he's trying to find, not just trying to find, he has found, and he is creating and has created a better way. I'm so proud of him for creating his company, Ways Too Well. That's the number two. You can check out their website at ways2well.com. Again, that's the number two. You can also check them out on Instagram at, at ways to well. And they are just in the business of functional medicine or integrative medicine, preventative, regenerative medicine, keeping you from getting sick instead of treating you when you already are. And most of the time, that's whenever it's really set in. So I'm really proud of Brigham creating ways to well. It's only a three year old company and they have. Uh, patients like Joe Rogan and Tim Kennedy and me and so many others that are incredible human beings. And we believe that this is some of the best of the best of the best treatment you can get in America today. It really is. And so they've treated uh, me in so many different ways that we're going to get into on the show. But I also want to give you a heads up. A heads up that I uh, had a heart to heart with Brigham throughout there. Brigham has lost uh, a brother, uh, his brother Preston, at 28 years old uh, due to the opiate epidemic uh, or pandemic in the world. And, um, and it's, it's crazy, you know, knowing a friend that lost someone to that, having so many friends that I've seen lose their life um, to that. And for me, what you're going to hear in this episode, uh, having fallen back to, um, addiction or substance abuse. So, uh, I'm going to go get, uh, some help and I've asked for that help and it's going to be, uh, I believe really good. Um, it's gonna be therapeutic and anyways, Brigham and I get into that also towards the end of the episode. So, uh, these podcasts are going to be coming out. Uh, we've stacked some up two days back to back, lots of hours in here so that I can, um, you know, have this as a process. I want this to be, uh, something that can be a resource to others. Sure. Help them. But I also believe it's helping me by bringing things out into the light. I shared in the show that I did a meditation earlier today and I just thought like this thing in me, this addiction that when it flares up, it's like this, this mold. And I normally go and I hide and I put it in the dark and that's where it thrives. That's where mold, fungus, gross stuff seems to, to just thrive is in the dark. So I'm trying to bring it into the light and bring it into the light as much as I can, not shy away from it, not hide from it and not hide from you and not share the truth that, uh, I relapsed and I've, I've had a hard time. And so, yeah, anyways, I guess bring it into the light is part of my process. It's the way that I know I will overcome it because if I keep it in the dark, it's going to thrive. But if I bring it into the light, it's going to barely survive because you bring some of those molds and funguses into the light, expose them to the sun. Um, those things start to shrivel, shrink and fade away and die. And that's what I want to part, uh, part of this addict mind of mine. It, it might always be there, but I want to, I want to, I want to keep it at bay. I want that thing to shrink down the smallest thing it can. 
And uh, I can't keep putting myself through this. I can't keep putting my friends, family, loved ones through it. I'm very grateful to the people that have supported me. Hot Pie Media knows. And uh, this is the studio. Um, and uh, Amy and everyone's been so supportive, so supportive for me uh, to go get help on it. Uh, knows the sponsor of this podcast. They know and they're behind me to go get support. Um, uh, Fight for the Forgotten Knows. And I uh, just got together with the chairman of the board, close friend of mine, and everyone supporting me to go get help. Um, and so I'm very, very grateful for that. So many other friends uh, sharing the show that I was just with Jared Padalecki. He stopped in studio today. Uh, after him and I had a heart to heart and I jumped in a nice bath and we were talking and we were talking about books to read while I'm gone. And he also shared more and more about his, uh, journey, um, that he went on whenever he needed to go to an inpatient, uh, facility that he shared on, on the podcast. If you missed that episode, please check it out. So yeah, let's, let's do this. Let's get into the episode and just know that what you're about to learn for yourself on your own healthcare journey, taking care of yourself. Health is wealth, but it doesn't have to be expensive. That's what I love about Brigham. Their average patient is paying less than $100 a month. And, uh, and you know, you can cut out the insurance company. You can cut out Big Pharma because he has the pharmacy that makes the medica medication for pennies on the dollar. Um, and they have the providers, they have everybody, they're the pharmacist, the, the, the nurse practitioners, the doctors, uh, they make the medication themselves in house. I've been there, I've toured it and it's incredible. So this is a unique episode and I'm really excited that you're about to get to tune in, to listen to one of my best friends in the world, Brigham Bueller. Brigham, you're smiling at me. I am. I love you, man. I love you, dude. <laughs> You are one of my best friends, and I'm really grateful that you're in my life. I and appreciate we're, you too. We're more doing than, this. more than you'll ever know. Hey, thank you. Thank you for being here today. And Brigham, you are well. Oh, actually, you you mentioned my shirt. We've been to Vegas together. I'm wearing UFC 264. Yeah, that was crazy. We're we're your, where your we boy Conor Corey. McGregor. <laughs> <laughs> Not your boy anymore, right? <laughs> Uh, used to be. I was a fan. You I was a fan. fan of the way he fought. I was not ever really a huge fan of the antics that came with him. But, yeah. uh, I mean, I appreciate him being exciting, but, right. uh, Poirier, man, that dude's on fire. He's yeah. terrifying. And what a dude with purpose, um, Dustin, and really to think about, take that from Dustin, your purpose is to really, for me being on the outside, looking in, um, you're trying to revolutionize healthcare. You've been in it since you were what, 21? Yeah, right out of college. Right out of college. And why don't we go into that a little bit? Well, why don't you, you're the founder of a company called Ways to Well, but you've also been the founder of several other companies all related to healthcare. Yeah, at 21, right out of school, uh, I went to University of Houston. I was in a sales program. It's actually a funny story. I, uh, I kind of fibbed on my uh, resume and I had said that oh, yeah? I had already graduated but I actually had a year left okay. and I did it because I was interviewing with Eli Lilly and I knew they were going to be launching this revolutionary new drug called Cialis, oh. which was the Viagra the heart competitor. Dr oh, oh, yeah. And so I didn't even know what it was. Yeah. It's a 30, <laughs> 36 hour Viagra is what it was. Um, and so I, in long story short, I didn't think I was going to get the job. It was more like practice and they gave me the job. So I had to go to the Dean at university of Houston and petition to take 24 hours in summer school. So I took 24 hours in like, uh, I think it was like a eight week time frame, 24 hours of college credits to graduate. So I could start, uh, at Eli Lilly at the end of the summer and launch the drug. Wow. Um, so you so helped just, launch Cialis in the United States of America. I did. I did. We, uh, actually carried Cialis, Prozac, Zyprexa, a bunch of mental health medications. And that's kind of where I began to see the dark side of, of healthcare and right. the broken system. And then from there, I transitioned to surgical cells at a really prominent surgical company called Stryker. Uh, and I, I did Stryker. that for 13 years with some of the best and brightest surgeons in the world. Yeah. Well, just on that, Amy and I were in Colorado and Project Cure, we were in their warehouse and Stryker had donated uh, beds for COVID yeah. and they had donated 22,000 beds to Project Cure and they had already sent 11,000 to 
some nation. Mm-hmm. I saw the other 11,000 getting ready to go to Cuba. And they said that we might get some of those beds and send them to Uganda. Heck yeah. So I was, I was pumped about that. But so let's go into, you've been, you've seen it all. You've seen it all. You've, you've been in the, the surgeries, mm-hmm. long, long hours. You've sold the pharmaceuticals. You've been part of uh, big pharma. You've been part of uh, battling with insurance companies and things mm-hmm. like that. And man, for, for me, this podcast is called overcome because we have overcome hundred percent of our darkest days. And I have to remember that. I hope that our listeners can remember that, but you are helping overcome a broken system and you want to make the old system or the current system obsolete by creating something better. And I really admire that about you. No, I appreciate it. That's, that's where innovation happens. <clears throat> And that's where change happens. And I, I feel like the system is obsoleting itself. It's so broken. It's so dysfunctional. Mm. Um, and after after 13 years in surgical sales, some of my surgeon buddies came to me and said, hey, we're looking at, in the state of Texas, opening a pharmacy. Um, and so I got an up close and personal look behind the scenes, more deep dive than I ever expected uh, and learned just what was going on with the insurance companies and uh, the big five is what they call them, which are the five biggest insurance carriers that provide most of the coverage for most Americans that have health insurance. Um, and there's just a lot of corruption and obstruction to care. Um, and they put small practices, whether a private practicing family practice doctor or a privately held pharmacy or lab, um, they put them out of business every day. Um, well, yeah, well, I think actually a ways to well post at it's on Instagram at ways, the number two, and then well, um, so ways to well, I think one of your last posts was, uh, about how the top five, uh, insurance company CEOs, that they just racked in over a hundred million dollars just for those five guys. Yeah. Just for those five guys yeah. who were paid like over $20 million each or something like that. Yeah, combined it's insane. Of that. It's insane. And Man, I think that one of the things you opened my eyes to is, and, and let me let me talk to Wazewell real quick because y'all have given me hope. It's been my lighthouse while I was out in the stormy waters of whether it was recovering from malaria and intestinal parasites and amoebas, a brain parasite, all this stuff. Like no one could really give me answers. And I've been going around to a lot of different places and I've just had this wrecked body that I've been trying to build back to. And when I talked to my provider, Denise, I was like, I just want to feel normal again. Yeah. And I remember her saying, why, why do you, why is that the goal? That was her question or something yeah. like that. And I go, what? Cause I want to feel normal again. I'm a, I'm an athlete. I'm trying to make a comeback to fighting. I'm, I'm wanting to live a long and healthy life and I want to make an impact. And I just want to feel normal again. And I remember I go, well, Normal, that's, that's, uh, I think she said, that's, that's noble. Yeah. She goes, but, but wouldn't you want to be optimal? Why, why don't you want to be the best you've ever been? And I was like, whoa, it was like mind blown. I was like, that's possible. Yeah. Because, and I think you, we had a similar conversation too, because that's so good. I didn't think at, you know, 33 years old, I can be, or th- now 34, I can be the best I've ever been. But because of ways to well, I honestly am feeling physically, uh, better than I have in a decade. And yeah. That I'm, for me is I'm huge. 40, better than I felt when I was 23. I'm 41. And, uh, at 33, I was on the verge of obesity, diabetes. Uh, I know I've talked about this on Amy's podcast. Um, my dad's diabetic, my brother's diabetic, my sister's diabetic, my grandparents are diabetic. Um, and that was a real fear of mine. And I was working out, I was seeing a nutritionist, I was doing all the right things at 33 years old. And I was on the verge of obesity. I was, I think, 24, 25% body fat, um, all of it. And I ended up, um, my nutritionist is who finally said, and hey, man, like something's not right. Has your doctor pulled blood work? And I was like, well, no. And he said, you need to go to the doctor and get blood work done. So I went to a primary care and tried to get my blood work. And he's like, well, we don't pull full panels and we don't treat um, hormone therapy um, you'll have to get in with a urologist. So jump forward three months later, I finally get in with a urologist, take a day off of work. I literally sat in the urology practice for like six hours waiting for this doctor to see me. They pull my blood. The doctor sees me for maybe 30 seconds. They send me home. I get a phone call two weeks later. 
and the, it's this, it's wow. this urologist and he says, I don't know if you're fat because you have low testosterone or you have low testosterone because you're fat, but you are definitely <laughs> fat with low testosterone. He's like, your testosterone came in at a hundred and which is wow. crazy low. Yeah. And so, I don't know much about it, but I know that that's like super low. Yeah. I know in fighting. I know like now range, I walk but... around at 1100, which oh, wow. is uh, on the upper threshold Jeez. and I feel phenomenal. And all my biomarkers are phenomenal. And we're looking at me at a biological level and of the purely biomarkers. I am younger biologically than I was at 33. Wow. Which is crazy to think. And I feel better than I ever felt at 33. Yeah. I should so. look into doing that. I want to know what my biological age is or whatever yeah. that is. That's, that's awesome. I, uh, for me going through ways, well, you, you mentioned diabetes and in your family, my family too both sides. And I found out through ways to well that I was pre-diabetic and they got me on a medication and it's easy. I just take it one time a night and it's not expensive, uh, which I am, I'm normally financially like frightened, I guess I could say mm -hmm. whenever I go to a doctor, a hospital, uh, because there's going to be big bills. It's going to be confusing yeah. whenever it comes to me and I'm going to be like, Oh shoot, I'm stuck with this. And then I find out later, I'm not actually stuck with this. There's like some fine print and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. And, and how, how would you explain that to someone that the system so, now confuses you Yeah, and you guys are doing it for pennies on the dollar and so the drop the, shipping the, it right to their door, like the Amazon. original system that people are used to the traditional healthcare system is you go to the doctor, the doctor attempts to bill your insurance. The doctor has a contract in place with that insurance carrier. And depending on your unique insurance plan, you may be on the hook for who knows what dollar amount when it comes to blood work or uh, a urine toxicology screening or a pharmacogenetic test or any sort of gene carrier test. You're unique in, and there's thousands, even if you, somebody says, why well, have Blue Cross Blue Shield? Do you, do, does that work? Your primary care doesn't know because there's literally a hundred different Texas Blue Cross Blue Shield programs. Wow. And he doesn't have the time to dig in or she to dig in and say, Hey, Justin, I'm sorry. Your, your Blue Cross isn't going to cover your blood work. And so what typically happens is if, and this is why doctors are scared to pull a full panel, they don't pull a comprehensive panel for twofold reason. One, if the insurance covers it and they start pulling comprehensive panels often, the insurance c carriers will use bullying tactics. They'll send them letters, threaten that provider's contract, tell that provider, if you continue to run up the cost of healthcare, we'll review your Blue Cross contract or your United contract, and we'll consider canceling you. Which for that primary care, he's out of he or she's out of business if that happens. So that's one. Because they'll be they'll, they'll they'll lose thirty forty. I mean, like yeah. they'll, they'll lose Cross a big in percent. The state of Texas is like thirty percent of their payer mix, and United's right behind it. So so if they lose one of those, they're it's, out. They're done. And so wow. they're terrified. The practice of these, is over. Correct. They're it, terrified I mean, of these big insurance companies. But the second fold is your contract with your particular insurance contract may not cover it. And it may state that they, by law, have to come after you for the balance. So like when I owned a lab, we didn't want to go after a patient for the remainder of the bill, but we would bill the insurance company. They would short pay us. And our contract legally said, if they short pay us, we still have to come after you for the difference. And the reason we didn't want to do that is you, the patient, then get upset, call your doctor and say, stop sending to this lab. They sent me a bill. Well, we sent a bill because your insurance didn't honor your plan and didn't pay us what they were supposed to. And mm -hmm. so either way, it's a lose-lose for a primary care provider who's in the broken system because either he's going to have a disgruntled patient who's pissed off that they got a big bill, or he's going to have a disgruntled insurance company that's beaten him down because he ran a comprehensive panel. And at the end of the day, the person who loses is the patient, is mm -hmm. you. Yeah. You're the one who doesn't get the full blood work up and doesn't get a full analysis of where you stand and if you're healthy. Mm. And we you you alluded to earlier, I want to feel normal. The average person's out there going, God, I just want to feel normal again. Yeah. Because you can't even get that in this broken system. You're right. Because <laughs> I mean, I want I want more time with a doctor in front of me. And that's what I found with you guys. And 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 I have been in a very great position where sometimes, you know, going in as a, a professional athlete or whatever, a doctor will give you a little more time because you're getting ready for a competition or this or that or whatever. 
but still it might only be 15 minutes. Yeah. If, if, if I don't open up and say, Hey, I've got this coming up and I really need this or that with these doctors, then, and, and like plead a case, like, please spend some more time with me and look at these symptoms. It, I don't think it's as simple as this right here. Correct. I think there's a lot more going on. I've been exposed to this. I've had this happen. I've have this condition. I have celiac here. This, I mean, it's taken so long to find out this stuff. Mm-hmm. And whenever I got the full blood panel, like the comprehensive full thing, I mean, you guys pulled like, I don't know, it seemed like a, over a hundred different things to look at my biology, what's going on in my body. I mean, you know, Amy was so encouraged with it. I mean, my family, friends that are on this, the, the chairman of the board of Fight for yeah. the Forgotten is a patient. Uh, I was with him uh, not too long ago, and he's telling me that um, he's been on it for four months now. And uh, how's he doing? He's doing good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He said it's it's good, and he looks good. I told him when I saw him, I was like, "You're looking great." Well, the man. goal of this is to be able to bring that boutique care to the masses. So I, I can say, even when Joe posted, um, Joe Rogan, yeah, yeah, when he posted about the care that he had gotten from Waste Well, somebody, you know, you know how that goes. Somebody immediately posted on there that something else that the rest of us will never be able to afford uh, mm. or something like yeah, that. Yeah, Cause we're not sure. Joe Rogan. And it's like, no, that's, that's traditionally been the misnomer. Like that's what people have thought, but at ways to well, are, we're usually less than the patient's copay or deductible on wow. a comprehensive blood panel. So for me, for instance, that urology story, not only did I get that news delivered to me in a real shitty way, I also then got a bill in the mail for three thousand three hundred and seventy five dollars. Okay. They billed my insurance three thousand yes. dollars, and then the insurance short paid it, so I was on the hook for the remainder. And the, the, at Ways to Well, it's very cut and dry, black and white. You know before you ever get your blood panel what the cost is. Our most expensive workup uh, is five hundred dollars, and that's typically a once in a lifetime blood draw. We don't have to do that workup every time. That's just to get your baselines and establish where there may be deficiencies. Um, and then that also gets you an hour on the phone, 45 minutes on the phone with our providers. So wow. we'll do a deep dive. Yeah. We'll go into every single biomarker. We'll explain to you what it means. We'll try and put it in layman's terms. You know, our goal is to make it, the other issue I have with the traditional system is it's almost a dictator standing on a stage and, and dictating to you here's what you're going to do. And here's what you're going to take. And you you need to lose weight and you need to do this. And that's not what we do at Ways to Well. We view it as you, the patient need to be empowered in your healthcare journey. We're just here as a resource. Mm. We're going to help educate you and help you understand why a medication may be beneficial and where it has its strengths and its weaknesses. And together with you, the patient build a unique plan to you. And oftentimes custom compound medications that are unique to you. Yeah. And I, I love, I love that you guys look beyond like just whatever symptom you're having and you get the full picture, right? It's not just like a narrow minded. It's, uh, it's like not just the microscope, it's the 30,000, uh, whatever foot view and from the plane. And then you guys also can kind of almost helicopter over it. And then you can kind of get down in, in a truck and then you're <laughs> getting out on foot and you just see it from all these different angles. You get the full picture. And then you're like, oh, this is what's going on. And oh, I'm dehydrated. I need to drink more water. Oh, I, you know, ask me questions about my sleep. Are you getting enough sleep? And just uh, obviously those are important. And then here you can supplement and this here you can put in this it's not always medications the answer to every problem isn't a medication oftentimes it's patterns and habits and and we can identify that in blood work like it's there's so many people they'll come in and how did you know that and and they'll break down biologically why they made that assumption Mm. like just the context oh yeah i remember it's almost like being a detective yeah (laughs) denise denise was uh and thank you denise for um yeah being, being so kind. She spent like, I've had four, I think four sessions with her now. And she's also helped me with the stem cells, the ways to well. And, um, and it's just been really, really good, man. And whenever I sat with her, she was, it was like, she was reading my mail or that she knew my history or that she knew my family and the things that, that they, that they also struggle with and helping me be preventative. What I love about ways to well is you guys don't just treat the disease. You want to prevent the disease from happening. So why, because you've seen the good, bad, and ugly 
of mm-hmm. the system. Why is it someone like me who is pre-diabetic, why wouldn't an insurance company want to prevent me from getting diabetes yeah. instead of treating me when I do? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So in the, you got to think in, in the U S all of these are privately held businesses uh, or, or, or private industry, sorry, not yeah. any, any sort of government entity. So the goal is bought, the bottom line is, or the goal is the bottom line It's the financials. And so it all comes down to dollars and cents. Uh, these are publicly held companies with, you know, investors and they have to achieve uh, Q f- quarterly results for wall street, all of those things. So at the end of the day, these companies bring forth greater and greater profits every year. And the only way to do that is to charge more or cover less. And so typically what we're seeing is they're doing both. Um, And so for an insurance carrier, they look at you as an individual and they know in the United States, the average person switches jobs every 24 months. So within two years, you're gone. And when you switch jobs, you typically switch insurances because most of the time your employer is who's providing your health benefits. And so if I'm an exec over at you know, United Healthcare, I look at it and go, well, to keep Justin from being diabetic is going to cost us, you know, $100 a month. If he becomes diabetic, we know it's an eightfold increase in annual care to keep you alive. So it's going to cost the healthcare system astronomically more to treat a diabetic than it is to stop you from becoming a diabetic. But the insurance companies don't care because you're somebody else's problem in two years. And so they would rather wow. kick the can down the road and say, let that other insurance company deal with that. See, that's, that's infuriating to me because if I'm your customer, your client, your, and I'm paying you, I should be getting the best service possible. Anyone out there in a, in a health journey that's struggling with their health, like this is one of the most important things in our lives is taking mm-hmm. care of our life. Yeah. And so, and I'm already, we're all of us are uh, most of us that have insurance. We're, we're, we're paying, you know, and why wouldn't they want to give you the best care? It's honestly so disheartening and having been behind the curtain, um, we didn't even get into where I went after surgical sales. Um, but during my stand of being a surgical rep and getting into the lab and pharmacy space, um, my little brother passed away unexpectedly of, uh, opioids. Yeah. Preston. Um, passed away of opioids. Was it 28 years old? Um, at 28. 28. And, uh, and, and, and really what it did was it opened my eyes to like how broken that system is because I had a pharmacy that was offering a non-abusive, non-addictive pain cream for patient, patients post-surgery. And insurances didn't want to cover it, but they're covering Oxycontin hand over fist, right? Uh, it's a cheap product. It's not expensive for them on a monthly basis. But the issue with that is it's highly addictive, highly abusive. And the whole pandemic of uh, opioid abuse was honestly created by big pharma and big oh, I insurance. I know I was, I was one of the victims of that where when I, when I, when I broke and dislocated my elbow, um, I was wrestling in New York. I was uh, going against a world champion, Olympic bronze medalist, and my arm snapped. And it was just a freak accident. I was taking to the ER and it took so long to get there in the ambulance in, in New York City, right? Like mm-hmm. Manhattan. Oh yeah, I bet. Leaving like Madison <laughs> Square Gardens or wherever. And, and, uh, and I got out of there, get a big bill from the ER and everything else, right? And I'm waiting to get my surgery. And at this time I had um, an insurance provider. I don't, I don't even want to mention it. And this insurance company said that I needed to go to this, like someone that's in network. Right. Yeah. Yep. And I, they were trying to send me to an ankle and knee surgeon who did a couple of elbow surgeries a year. So real quick before where you're going with that and not to interrupt, but that's the, that's one of the problems. So a lot of times, like for me, when I owned a lab, I went to the big insurance cares and I said, we want to be on contract. We, what does it take to be an in network lab? And the rates that they would offer to reimburse us were so low that we would lose money every time we ran a specimen because they're, it's a, it's a, they're bullies. Yeah. And so what patients don't realize is oftentimes your, your insurance plan has what's called out of network benefits, but your insurance company tries to intimidate you mm. into only seeing in network providers. And so mm. 
But the problem with that is oftentimes the in-network provider is a piece of shit. It's not yeah. the right guy, candidly. Yeah. Like they're yeah. going to send, like the story you're telling yeah, happens I'm, I'm a li- million I'm, times I'm a day. I'm living it and I'm not trying to get special <laughs> treatment, but I want an elbow doctor to do yeah. my elbow surgery since yeah. I live at the Olympic, tra- I was living at the Olympic training center. I was a world-class wrestler, at least a all-American national champion wrestler. And I have a goal of being a professional fighter. I'm 18 years old. I get my arm snapped off. You know what they did while well, I had to wait because I'm like, I'm not going to that guy for surgery. And I'm not going to that one. Yeah. And for four months, four months Whoa. with a completely torn ulnaral uh, UCL, my, uh-huh. my ulnaral collateral ligament. And uh, I had nerve damage in my funny bone mm-hmm. and I'm in so much pain. I'm walking around with that. It cannot heal. They see it on the images. And so what do they do? The doctor gives me Oxycontin advertised to me as mm-hmm. personally as the only non-addictive opioid on the market today. Yeah. Well, and, and two on that note, dope sick. If, I haven't if seen you dope haven't sick yet. seen it or any of the listeners haven't seen, if you want to see a glimpse, what is that on? Uh, it's on Hulu, Hulu, but it is a, it's based on the true story of Purdue pharma. Who's the manufacturer of oh, oxy yeah, for sure. oxy and their collaboration with the FDA to get that approval as a non-addictive opioid. And then two years later, the head of the FDA took a job with guess who? Yeah. Of Purdue, Pharma, Purdue Pharma making millions of dollars a year. And it turned out that the drug was addictive as hell the whole, the whole time. time. It's actually the most addictive opioid dude, on the market. Oh, in the world. I mean, well, yeah, it, on the market. And dude, mm-hmm. it's, it is, it's scary. Yeah. I am an Oxycontin addict, Oxycontin, Oxycodone. Like, I, mm-hmm. like, dude, I, I just, that almost took my life because it, it only takes like less than two weeks to yeah. get, a, to get hardcore. Well, then what happens that. is as soon as the government, so the FDA alongside with Purdue creates this opioid pandemic and then, I mean, I, we could go on for days. And then, sure. so then I had at the time non-abusive, non-addictive pain cream options. And I would go educate providers on why you should not be prescribing these meds. And half of them would say, well, Oxy is not addictive. I'm like, okay, if you don't think it's addictive, then you should at minimal implement a compliance program in your practice with a regular toxicology screen every 30 days on any patient who you're prescribing that medicine to, to make sure that there's no diversion, that they're not getting their pills and going and selling them on the street. And so we would roll out a toxicology test and I would put a phlebotomist in a practice and we would help these physicians structure compliance programs. And it worked for about two years. And then the insurance company said, we're not reimbursing any more toxicology. So literally I have, I can't staff you. I can't even run the test because your insurance company won't cover it, but they're still covering your oxy. Wow. So they're getting rid of the part of the compliance and regulatory that in a way could help us shield innocent people from becoming victims of addiction. Right. But they're covering the product that's causing the addiction. It's mind blowing. It's so broken. I mean, isn't it just a cheek swab or what is it that you can. We did. We had a, we had two options. We had a cheek swab and we also had a urine sample and either one, we could do either one. Depending someone's on the patient. going to be uh, an addict also. Oh, that well, that's one. separate. That's, that's, that's a, separate. so there's also, we offered a pharmacogenetic test and, um, the insurance companies covered that as well for about 12 to 18 months. Right. And this is very commonplace. So it's going to sound repetitious, but pretty much anything on the market, the insurance companies cover for a period of time and then cease coverage. And so pharmacogenetic tests through a simple cheek swab, we could let a parent know if they were at risk of passing along any sort of genetic deficiency to their child. We could tell you if you're an outlier who can't metabolize opioids because then you so then it wouldn't st- even help you anyways. And, and there's get no addicted. benefit, but you have the addictive qualities of wow. the opioid. And it's not going to help you with your pain, but, but it, it will it, cause it, you to be an addict. Yeah. And Jeez. the other thing it helps a doctor with. And if you ever watch Dope Sick, they, they began to say, doctors would say, well, hey, you said this is a 24-hour time release, but my patients are waking up in the middle of the night calling me. And they coined the phrase, breakthrough pain. So the truth was the half-life of it wasn't what they were saying it was. Right. They were calling it breakthrough pain, like in their answer to fix it, guess what? More. Give them another oxy. Yeah, for or sure. Or double the dose. 
And yeah. so what we were doing with pharmacogenetic testing is I could tell a provider whether you're a slow, fast, or moderate metabolizer. So I would go meet with primary cares and I'd say, look, this is really important. Yeah. One, please don't write these meds. Yeah. I understand there's a place for everything and there's a tool Unless for it's every- Unless it's absolutely needed, right? Correct. Necessary. And I'm like, we have a non-addictive, non-abusive pain cream as an option. If that doesn't work, uh, or you don't want to write it and you are going to write oxy, then at minimal do a pharmacogenetic test. Let's identify if this patient can metabolize the meds and then let's build a compliance program to make sure they don't divert the meds. Yeah, do what you do what you said you would do during your oath to do yes. no harm, right? Yes. Like, hey, this can make sure that like you'll know if they're going to be an addict yeah. and you'll know if it's going to be effective and you'll know if it's going to help instead of and, hurt. And that's what's hard because as a provider, I, I feel terrible for these guys because they're looking at it going, I've got eight minutes. Mm. I've got eight minutes to get you in and out of here. On average, in the United States, they spend eight minutes with a patient in a primary care practice. So they have eight minutes to get you in and out. They're going to refer you off to a pain specialist in the new world. In the old world, back when this when the opioid pandemic took off, primary cares were prescribing opioids. Um, and they were framing it as people with migraine headaches. Yeah. And they had big pharma educating them, bringing lunches and telling them, Hey, use it in this space and it's safe and it's non addictive. So that to the doctor's credit, they were acting off the data they were given. They also had this exemption with the FDA in their label that said the only non addictive opioid basically, or yeah. reduced risk of addiction is the actual verbiage that the okay. FDA approved. But the FDA approved it. I think it that was how they, they said it to me, though. Yeah. Yes. And so doctors would go and think, well, this is non addictive. The patients love it. It treats their pain. They seem happy. Insurance covers it. That checks all the boxes for a primary care. They just want to get yeah, you so in and out. Truly want, they want to minimize your headache. Is trying to help. Correct. Their I don't think intent. anyone had no, bad yeah, yeah, yeah. intentions. Except for maybe the guys Except filling their Purdue, pockets. Purdue Pharma. Right. Yeah, big pharma. So let, let me tell you a little bit about my story because. Um, I don't know if I've ever really shared it with you totally. No, no, I, I know about. Elbow. Dude, I had to do two or three, I think it was three a pills or whatever it is with that insurance company to get an actual elbow surgeon that was a sports medicine, mm -hmm. you know, guy. Um, and it took the third. Yeah, it was three. I think the first was like a letter. The second was something. And then the third was like, go in person with like this letter from the, the, I'm pretty sure it was in person or something where the, basically the doctor that they wanted to do the surgery that was in network basically yeah. had to go to bat for me saying, I'm not uh -huh. doing it. I'm not doing it because of these reasons. Yeah. You He's know? not qualified to do the surgery yeah. most likely. One, they didn't think they were going to be able to find a cadaver that would like to yeah. take a, a the ligament and put it back in from an elbow and it's, into mine. It's the same. I had to explain that to Tim because they were the insurance. Well, he he's actually, you know, special forces. Yeah. So his was, that's um, Tim Kennedy. Yeah. And his was, he's a patient of ways to well, and he, I've his, been there with him getting treatment. Yeah. And he's, he's an awesome guy, but he his is. was at VA. He, they were sending him to a VA hospital and then he sent me the surgeon's name who was going to do his ACL. And I looked it up and I called him and I said, Tim, this is like going to, a Muay Thai fighter and asking him to teach you jujitsu. Jitsu. He's wow. not a sports me sports medicine fellowship trained surgeon. He may be capable of doing the surgery, but he's definitely not your optimal choice for this procedure. For sure. You need to go to somebody who's sports medicine trained. Yeah. And so it took some work, but we found him, uh, somebody who accepted TRICARE, who was at the VA, who was affiliated with the VA hospital, who was trained in that specialty to administer that procedure. And wow. it's just, it's, it's what already a, a rough road on an injury like that. You don't need to make it harder. Right. What a broken system, man. Well, so for me, I, I had to do those appeals to finally get a doctor that could do the, the right surgery or do it well. But dude, I was already an addict before I ever got the surgery because it took four months. Mm -hmm. It took four months mm -hmm. of waiting and pain, waiting and pain. So what happened after it? I'm in pain and they up it because I just had the surgery. So they upped the dosage on me. And then whenever that runs out, guess what? They didn't stop prescribing it to me, bro. Yeah. I had, this is before they started communicating across state lines mm -hmm. and I got back to it. And from 18 to 23 years old, I was a hardcore Oxycontin addict. I took Oxycontin. I snuck it onto the ultimate fighter TV show with me because I couldn't be without it because the withdrawals were oh, yeah. so damn mm. bad. 
I don't wish that on my worst enemy to go through oxycodone. Well, that's withdrawals. what we didn't realize. My brother was going through that, but he had gotten addicted to opioid pills. He was. Mm. I, I don't remember if it was oxy, but it was one of the opioid pills prescribed by a doctor originally. Then it was he was sourcing it from school with somebody, and then once the opioid pandemic was identified and you know finally exposed, everything went. Whoo- like the restrictions, every primary care is quit writing it. You had to go to an interventional pain doctor. Pain doctors are required to do triplicate, which means they got to document all this stuff. Just a lot mm. more legal jargon and risk for the providers to prescribe it. Right. So a lot of times providers are like, I'm not prescribing it. Yeah. And if you're a user, they're definitely not prescribing yeah. it. And so a lot of people in those instances, a lot of these overdoses mm. that a lot... More people have died of opioids than we know because a lot of people who have died of opioids transitioned yeah, to sure. something else like heroin yeah. or another. Or people were snorting heroin and that's what got my my little brother is he went, couldn't get the pills anymore, was fiending for it. A guy said, hey, I've got heroin you can snort. It's the same thing. It's better. It's cheaper. And they had cut it with fentanyl mm. and fentanyl can stop your heart instantly. Sure. Well, I mean, I think fentanyl is a hundred times stronger than oxy. Yeah. And then that car fentanyl or whatever is like a thousand times stronger. Yeah. It's dangerous stuff. That stuff, that stuff like, well, they use it to put down an elephant, like a very little amount to put down an elephant. And they're starting to even put car fentanyl inside of stuff now because you've got to use less of it, but that stuff will instantly kill you just like, I mean, even more. And they're making this stuff in a bathtub and they're not these... The people making heroin typically aren't scientists or PhDs <laughs> right. or, and they're not making yeah. it in labs. Well, so, so yeah, for sure. It's all dangerous. The thing that I had, this was 11, I mean, 14, what was that? I mean, you know, 16 to like 11 years ago or whatever that those five years, um, from 18 to 23, I, I had three different doctors in three different States cause I'm an athlete and I'm training, I'm going on fight camp or traveling and all this stuff that were giving me like 90 pills, 60, 90 Mm -hmm. oxys Mm -hmm. every month, every month. And, uh, and then whenever that would run out, I would have to find it elsewhere. And dude, it's almost taken my life twice. And it's Mm -hmm. so disheartening to me to, and man, I feel for you with Preston, man. I really, really do. And the thing it was that, a shock. It was such a shock because I'm like, I'm sitting here. This is literally my worst nightmare. This is what I've been arguing with these doctors in this broken system for the last we're trying three to stop years, it. trying to stop things fr- like this from happening. And then right in my own like family, mm. we had that tragic loss. And it was it was a lot. It was it's definitely hard. And to this day, um, I still harbor resentment, obviously, to the broken system. And to big pharma. And that's, that's partially why we started, uh, ways to well was we're going to, we're going to go poke the bear right in the chest. Our goal is to go after big pharma and cut their legs out, provide better medications for pennies on the dollar, mail to patients, doorsteps, work hand in hand with the patient to give them the best treatment option for them, Mm. not the best treatment option for our pocketbooks, like the big insurance carriers are doing. And I feel like they're going to hang themselves. Like mm. they're exposed. Everyone knows big pharma now is scumbags. Everyone knows yeah. big insurance now is scumbags. I don't know anyone who loves their insurance carrier. Mm. Most people are fed up. I've, I never have. I've never yeah. been, I've never been thankful one time in my life for insurance. And, and honestly, in most of my adult life, I haven't had it. I've not had insurance. Um, and in fact, I don't right now. And, uh, and, but I'm not scared cause I got you guys yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and, uh, and it's, it's really like, so much better where I'm like, I, I don't, I don't leave my home. I, I'm, I'm doing it virtually. I, I, the medications are sent right to my front doorstep and it's just, I'm just feeling so much better, man. It's, it's a, instead of a hopeless experience, mm-hmm. it's a hope filled I love experience. Well, we were saying before our, our motto was always when we started this, you know, the system is sick care and we're practicing health care. Oh, wow. It's not a health care system. It's a sick care system. They treat the sick. They wait till you're disease ridden and sick to finally act. And what we want to do at Ways to Well is help you with the aging process, help you not get sick, help you not transition to those disease states, stop the diabetes when it's pre-diabetes 
let's be proactive, not reactive. Yes. And so we don't practice traditional medicine. I guess a lot of people would call ways to well functional medicine or regenerative medicine. Um, but it's basically all that means is preventative care. Yeah. We're here to catch you healthy and maybe you need some tweaks. Maybe you need a little help. Maybe the oil needs to be changed, whatever it is. But we want to, we want to change the oil before the motor blows out. And the, the system today waits for the motor to blow out yeah. and then says, oh, okay, now we'll cover it. Well, not giving you any, not giving you any oil changes until you're at like yeah. 200,000 miles on your car or on your engine. And then all of a sudden it's broken. There's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. We're just, man, it's so crazy. But bro, I, I think that I want to go back to something because you said you were harboring resentment. I think that might be at least on the service level. That might be one of the healthiest ways I could think of you to process and also to honor Preston's memory mm -hmm. and his life. He's your brother and you saw the system fail him. And now you're trying to create something that will serve more people and no, to help I love them. That. I appreciate that. Yeah, and we really are. I really truly believe there's a better way. I don't, yeah. it's not, I know at this point, I know for a fact in my heart of hearts, we can help people. And the feedback that we have gotten is unbelievable. People who, uh, you know, it's crazy, especially when we talk about uh, placental derived tissues or what yeah. a lot of people are calling stem, stem cells. cells Some yeah. of the results Mesenchymal we've had from that are unbelievable. Or, yeah, man. Which I, mean, I have yeah. a, I have a whole, uh, if you, if you do want to talk about the stem cell stuff, I've got a, a ton of education on that uh, after going to Neil Reardon's uh, signature biologics facility and touring it 30, 30 something thousand square feet wow. of regenerative uh, placental derived tissue. Like it's, it's a crazy operation. Yeah. Well, let's, let's get into that in a, in a minute um, because you've been helping a lot of, a lot of my friends and mm -hmm. it's been really cool to see whether it's been uh, Joe Rogan or Tim Kennedy or uh, Cal Kingsbury or Aubrey, like, like for me, I, I think I can, I can share that, that they, they love what you're doing and I do too. And Amy and my, 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 uh, chairman on my board. And it's just whenever, I mean, I guess that, that feedback, I mean, these guys, to me, I, I look up to these guys, I admire them and for them to be telling me and, and for, I've heard them tell you that this is some of the best. I mean, this is the best of the best of the best. It's it's care. really amazing. It's got to be like to see the domino effect yeah. because of people like you who talk about us that have a platform, you know, because Waste Well, we're, we've only been around three years. We're a small company. Um, but because of people like you, Gordon Ryan, yeah, Joe, Gordon Ryan. people yeah. are finding us. And, and Gordon posted about us helping him with his GI problems. And, you know, he was, he thought it was a hopeless case. And he's and for people that don't know about Gordon Ryan, he's pound for pound, the best grappler in the world. Um, and he was retiring mm -hmm. because, and how old is he? Like 25, yeah, 26, 20, I think 25, some, some crazy like that. He's a phenom and he was going to retire because he could not like me felt hopeless in his health journey. And was being told all these different things, conflicting things, no matter what doctor he went to. And I mean, to have the comprehensive, like, look at your entire body and being and to have one team you can go to and other things like that. It's just, it's just, it's he powerful. Po he posted that he had gained, um, I think 18 pounds of muscle mass, uh, since he had started treatment with us and he felt so much better because he was able to eat again yeah. and he was still dealing with some of the issues, but he said if, if he was like on a scale of zero to a hundred, he was at a zero and now he's at a 50. And that was a few months ago and we're trying to get him to a hundred and that's the yeah. goal. But that post led to a girl out of Arkansas reaching out to us who had been on a feeding tube for three years, Oh my God! three years. Uh, long story short, we ran her through the ways 12 program. We aren't GI specialists. It's not our focus, yeah. but this girl was desperate. She called us. We did what we do and, you know, addressed the areas that we know how to address uh, obviously she's, she's still seeing a GI specialist back in sure. Arkansas, but she called us maybe three weeks ago, literally crying on the phone and said that for the first time in three years, she ate without a feeding tube, Wow, which is mind blowing. Yeah. And it's, it's just like, that's the power of some of this regenerative 
treatments are insane. It's, and, it's and, really and, and integrative medicine that like functional integrative, mm-hmm. preventative, regenerative, whatever words you want to use, but like putting it all together Yeah, because it's not just one thing. It's Correct. like, let's look at the full picture. Correct. And what is that for you, bro? Getting a call like that, hearing about the impact, like knowing that someone that was on a feeding tube for three years has now been able to eat a meal. Like what is, what does that do for you, your drive or just, I mean, it's amazing. Fulfilling? It makes all the hard days and sleepless nights. And, you know, I put my life savings into this thing. Yeah. Um, You're one of the hardest workers and, I know, bro. And it's been, I appreciate that. It's been, uh, there's days that are really hard. Yeah. So calls like that really mean a lot. They help to hear the feedback. It, it's like, I know we're on the right path. I know we're doing the right thing. And I know if we just keep our head down and have the best of intentions and do right by people and help people live their happiest, healthiest life, everything else is going to take care of itself. Yeah. And that's, that's all we want to do at Ways to Well is, is help people be the best version of themselves and live longer, healthier lives. Well, I hope, I hope, I hope our listeners, but I hope you can hear me that you're one of the most authentic people I've ever known. And like, that's just who you are. And because you're at the helm steering the ship and you have a great team around you, but that's your heart. And from your history, man, of being on the dark side, seeing the broken system, seeing people be failed, seeing people taken out. Mm -hmm. I think that, I think that what you're onto, man, I know it. I feel it. I believe it like you do Mm -hmm. that like the hard days are worth it, man. I've seen you go through struggles and hard times. I've seen you up against a lot and I just, I love seeing the people that are coming to support or to be treated and to get helped. But then once they're so helped, like, I mean, tell me what your referral rate is. You guys don't have this big advertising budget. No, Like your Um, patients, thousands. Our average patient refers us one and a half people. So, and then we have, I think a it was an 87% retention rate. So most people are ecstatic and they refer us more than one friend, um, which is insane. That's the biggest compliment that a practice could receive. Um, and so we're just thankful that we've made it this far and excited to see what we can do as we scale this thing. Um, we're statewide now. Um, the goal long-term is to go nationwide. Um, mm. Our pharmacies already nationwide pretty much. We're in 43 states. Um, ways to well providers cover the state of Texas today. Um, we can treat folks outside of the state of Texas, but we have to administer the initial consult here in Texas okay. um, to be able to provide continual care. Just yeah, so because if someone the nature is desperate, of our license. I mean, if they don't have a, I mean, there's. Especially with, with what people are calling stem cells or regenerative, yeah. like that's an in-person visit anyway. So if it somebody is. has a major injury, uh, knee, shoulder, elbow, you know, any of those orthopedic based injuries where people are using the placental derived tissues or what people are calling mesenchymal stem cells. Right. Um, we are going to administer that in person. So typically people fly into Houston, we onboard them as a waste well patient we treat, and then their continued care with peptides or whatever may follow. Um, we can mail directly to their doorstep. This episode of Overcome with my man, Brigham Bueller, one of my best friends is brought to you by On It dot com on it.com slash overcome and you will save yourself 10 percent and guess what on it or, or sorry on it is actually buddies with uh brigham bueller and brigham bueller is a friend of on it i go in there and i work out uh with brigham at on it gym atx and right before this podcast we had some alpha brain and here we go on the screen we have alpha brain focus shots uh that the, their peach flavor is really good but my favorite flavor is their tropical because my favorite fruit is passion fruit, also pineapple. And they combine those and it's really, really good. You can save yourself 10% at onit.com slash overcome. They also have some incredible uh, fitness equipments like their kettlebells that Brigham and I are used to slinging around in the gym. They've got the gorilla and orangutan and chimpanzee faces. They also have another thing with faces on it. Whenever it comes to the quad mace, if you haven't ever used a steel mace or a quad mace that has these faces on it, it's actually an incredible workout that I just started learning at the Onnit Academy or Onnit Gym ATX. And so 
Thank you so much on it for having my back in Brigham Bueller as I go get well at treatment. Thank you guys for letting me be open, honest, real, transparent so that um, I can continue on my journey, my process of overcoming. All right, back to the episode. That's incredible. And well, that was a great transition to get back into um, how, to, what's the correct way to say it? Not stem cells. Well, so <laughs> I, mean, I got, are, I got, I got, I got highly educated on cool. this. Yeah. Well, so educate me because uh, I've, I've had, I've been very fortunate in a way that when I, when I threw a big overhand right before the ultimate fighter finale, I caught, uh, an elbow on my, my bicep mm -hmm. and dude, that thing popped. And I had a, like a two camels humps on my bicep mm -hmm. and the, at Stedman's, uh, Stedman's clinic, Stedman Hawkins clinic in Denver, it would take the air force Academy guys. And the only injury they had ever seen this uh, like is with the paratroopers mm -hmm. They would jump out of the plane and the paracord or whatever would wrap around their bicep or arm and then pull and tighten. Mm -hmm. Anyways, I, I had PRP at that time, platelet rich yep. plasma and dude, my bicep grew back in like three weeks and yeah. I was young at the time. Yeah. Right. And I know that this stuff is like trumps that, right? Yeah. And so, and I've been a beneficiary using you guys, but I also have broke my knee one time before I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. I got the stem cells put in my knee and literally I was supposed to be on crutches and not put any weight on my knee for six full weeks or eight weeks, I think. Mm -hmm. it was six to eight weeks, no, no weight, non-weight bearing. And... Uh, at two weeks after the first set of injections, I, I had to go prepare to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. So, uh, the NFL network is following me. Actually, no, I, I was able to get the stem cells at two weeks, four weeks. in, I went to Colorado. It was mm -hmm. actually four weeks in, and I climbed two of the tallest mountains in Colorado oh, with wow. the NFL network following me at six weeks. I'm at the summit yeah. of Kilimanjaro because of the power of regenerative medicine. Yeah. I mean, I was literally not supposed to be putting my foot on the ground. And at six weeks, I had already climbed three or two Colorado 14ers and Mount Kilimanjaro to 19,341 feet. Awesome. And I would not have been able to do that. And we're raising funds for Fight for the Forgotten and for Chris Long with Waterboys. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, I can't miss this. Like all these people have been supporting, giving however many dollars per foot of elevation I was climbing. Mm -hmm. Like I got to go do it. I can't let them down. And so regenerative medicine made it possible for me to do it. It made me possible for me to go in there for that fight. And now I'm feeling better. I've had my knees, my shoulders, all that stuff that you guys have been helping take care of in me. Yeah. And so tell me, educate me now. I just, I've been the beneficiary. Well, so, so many it's, people say, what, are, my what are stem cells? And I heard you can't get stem cells in the United States. And why would people go to Panama or Germany or some of these other places in that? So what you can't technically call what we do stem cells because stem cells is one component of the tissue. Mm. Um, there are SM or MSCs or mesenchymal cells uh, in the tissue that we utilize. But in the United States, all of these tissues fall under what's called a 361 designation, which is a minimally manipulated tissue. So during the George Bush era, um, they were scared that people were going to be aborting fetuses and, right. and then turning around and cloning and using all these things to create stem cells to, you know, provide the real fountain of youth. Well, bro, after so there my, was a lot of fear around After it. my first post with well, yeah. when, when Joe and I got the treatment, like someone was just spamming my stuff and messaging me and they were like, you are a devil worshiper. You took baby embryos and you yeah. put them inside yeah. of you. They're stem cells. So, from, I'm like, what? Signature biologics is the tissue bank we utilize for anything we do. And it was that's founded the best by, of the best of the best. Correct. It was yeah. founded by Neil Reardon, uh, who's known as the godfather of stem cells. He yeah. also has a clinic in Panama. In Panama, he administers stem cells. What is that? What they do is they take a placental derived tissue, like an umbilical cord, they extrapolate out and isolate just the stem cells. They put them in a Petri dish and they don't clone them. They cultivate them. They're going to clone themselves. They multiply. So the cells multiply and cultivate in a dish for, I think, three or four weeks. And then they literally inject those cells straight into your bloodstream. And there's a lot of therapeutic benefits and healing factors and growth factors and all sorts of stuff in those treatments. And they're using it for an array of different things that would be considered off label in the United States. Our main focus in the U S and, and the main indication from the FDA with that three, six, one designation says you're not allowed to manipulate the tissue. So we take an umbilical cord derived tissue 
um, from a healthy mother, healthy but baby, uh, pre-planned C- that donates yeah, it, yeah. pre-planned C-section. One out of ten of the uh, placental derived tissues make it through the rigorous screening process right. of Signature Biologics. But the benefit of that is we I now say it's it's beyond stem cells. Hmm. So rather than saying it's not stem cells because there are live stem cells, but legally in the U.S. you can't call it stem cells because we didn't isolate out just stem cells. Right, and and I think. I mean, not to cut you off, but to just have the dialogue. I think that what I've, because look, I'm a professional athlete, right? And so I've had so many snake oil salesmen (laughs) that are like uh, this, this, not even a, I mean, there's like a yogi chiropractor guy that's like, I've got these stem cells and they've been sitting on a shelf. They haven't been frozen. Yeah. And he's like, give me, give me. $1,500 $1,500 for this and I'll shoot it in your knee. Yeah. And these are stem cells and, and they why, will change your life. And that's why the FDA is hammering people yeah. for touting that. Because if you don't cryopreserve the cells, they begin to deteriorate instantly. So everything we get from Signature Biologics- What's that fridge or is, freezer at? It's, it's like negative, negative 50 80 or degrees. Eight, wow. Um, and we have five minutes to administer the treatment from when we dethaw it before you start to have cellular death. But the beauty of it is what I try to explain to people is you don't necessarily want like people. Are, well, why wouldn't I fly to Panama? One, it's going to be twenty five thousand dollars plus um, Two, if it's an orthopedic injury like a knee, you're better off with the placental derived tissues because you're getting stem cells plus. Mm. So you're getting the MSCs, which are the mesenchymal cells. Right. You're getting exosomes. You're getting cytokines. You're getting anti-inflammatories. You're getting scaffolding because we're putting a live tissue into your joint. And so think of it as a cushion. It's like a mm. scaffolding right. that takes effect in the knee to provide you with that cushion. So for an orthopedic injury, the FDA has already done people a huge service here in the United States because they have the most cutting edge, best treatment option possible um, that hopefully prevents you from going into surgery. Um, yeah. For sure. Man, it's, it's a really great option. And if there is somebody listening to this that is, is dealing with a nagging injury, um, or, or doesn't want to go get surgery. I mean, this is the first line of defense for me now, for now on where if, so if, if hitting up ways to well is, is, I mean, thank you. Thank you, Brigham for what you've done for me and a lot of my friends. And, but I think how do, so I don't want to scare people off because, because the stem cells, I mean, that, that can be thousands, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or not stem cells. So how do, how do I say it one more time? Beyond stem cells. Beyond stem <laughs> Beyond cells can stem be cells are placental a couple grand tissues. or a few grand yeah. and everything else. But for the average patient of ways to well, for just to get your, to get you to your optimal health, what do you think an average patient is, is kind of. Our average patient at? right now, because we have all the analytics is spending under a hundred dollars a month on average. Wow. And so. So don't be scared not, off. That's, that's what I love. I, I, I think I spent less than that. So, yeah. and we have uh, people all over. I mean, we have yeah. pro athletes and people that, you know, have the expendable income and they, it, it's almost like a tier system, right? I'm feeling great, but I'd like to push a little more on this or I'd like, Oh, my, this wasn't perfect on my blood work. What's an option. And so there's things we can adjust. And obviously the more we uh, add on treatments and, and all that, the more the, the price can rise, but, sure, but typically under a hundred dollars, we have some people spending maybe three to $400 a month, but those right. are more, um, but, bro, but bro, when I was going to these, when I was going to a psychiatrist that put me on not one, but two, what they call now red light drugs, mm-hmm. which means when you take them, it's very dangerous. You're going to want to kill yourself. Mm-hmm. And I was never given the cheek swab or whatever gene yeah. test or whatever to, yeah. to say, you know, this one's safe for you. If the safe one doesn't work, then this yellow light one, we'll do this, but we'll monitor you. Mm-hmm. But hey, this red light one, like, fuck that. Yeah. Don't you ever take that shit yeah. because you'll probably, for your biology, yeah. you're probably going to want to kill yourself. Yeah. And that's why they have it at the end of every single commercial, yeah. like every single one. Yeah. And like, I found out whenever I went to an actual great doctor, like Dr. Daniel Amen, um, that, oh, you shouldn't be on these at all. Like, yeah. get you off these. And- why, why do I even go into that? It's like, dude, I'm, I can't believe that. I don't know. Like I was spending $1,200 a month on two medications. Oh no, one, $1,200 a month on this medication that was literally making me want to kill myself or at least make me a zombie. Well, depressed. It's funny. It's funny. Then, you're, you're saying all that. And I, I haven't said this yet, but that in-house, when we started this, I said, it has to be the three C's. And that was the mm. phrase that we coined in-house was, uh, cost effective. So we've got to be able to be affordable to the masses. We can't be 
some boutique medicine that only the rich and affluent can afford because that yeah. doesn't fix the broken system. It doesn't. Uh, we've well, got to be convenient, right? The average person who is working that nine to five job doesn't have eight hours to sit at a urology practice like I did and hope that the urologist spends more than eight minutes with them. Right. So everything with us is convenient in that it's from the comfort of your own home. It's a digital consult. Um, and then all the medications are mailed to your doorstep. So any treatment option, you don't even have to go pick it up. It's all mailed to your house, just like Amazon. Um, and then the last C is comprehensive. Uh, I feel like a lot of the standard healthcare practices are missing the mark because the system doesn't allow them to give you a comprehensive workup. Yeah. The system obstructs your ability as a patient to have that provider truly do a deep dive, look at all these biomarkers, spend 45 minutes with you, and let's have a conversation. Let's yeah. educate you and, and empower you. I love those three C's. And the thing that I, I started making think on comprehensive is that the current system is so complicated, but you are so much less educated and actually know what's going on, know how to pay the bill, know how to, to go get the medication, know how to do all this stuff. But then y'all's is so much more comprehensive. Mm -hmm. You get educated so much more, but it's so much less complicated. Yeah. You guys do give me a uh, hundred things to look at and I get to measure it and track it and see my progress, which is so hope it gives me hope. And the goal long-term for me is to turn this into, we're launching an app, um, hopefully in the next 18 months, it's in the development phase. And we want to tie into wearables. We want to sure. tie in all your treatments, everything that you're on, the date you started. We're going to measure your biorhythms. In addition to your blood work, it'd be, the hope is to tie into a wearable and be able to see your HRV and all of your various uh, data points in addition to your blood work. And then put all that in an organized, like color coded uh, chart to let the patient know how are you trending? Are you getting enough sleep? Did your sleep improve when you started treatment? When we added one medication, did your sleep decline? What was the reason for this spike or this decline? And data is power. The more yeah. data we can compile, the more comprehensive we can make your treatments, the better for everyone. Dude, I love that. I'm, I'm excited for the future, man. I'm excited for the future of ways to well. I'm excited for the future of your life, our friendship. But I'm, I'm excited to see people start getting some, some hope like I did because dude, I can't believe that I was spending literally 10 times more mm -hmm. for medication that could have killed me almost did. And then, and then I'm spending 10 times less and I'm getting a hundred times the care, you yeah. know, with you guys. It's, it's so incredible, man. I love it. I appreciate it, man. I love it. Brigham, bro, this has been a lot of hard work. I mean, you already kind of alluded to like, it's, it's taken a lot to get here and I've been watching you, bro. And it has been a lot. You've done so much. I mean, you have ways to well, but you also have revive the mm -hmm. pharmacy that I get my medications from. And what has this process been like? What, I mean, I'm just gonna let you take it from there. Well, we, we realized, you know, one of the, the three C's, right. Convenient was one of them and cost effective was the other. And when we started this, it was hard to make those work for patients. Um, you know, patients obviously, and rightfully so have concerns about the cost of care. And for us, when we didn't have Excuse a me. manufacturing facility to make the medications, we were at the will of big pharma. Yeah. So as much as we were trying to provide better, better care, better um, service to a patient through our providers, we were still defaulting back to treatments from big pharma. And so, mm -hmm. um, what we did at ways to well was we built out a 503 a pharmacy, which is a sterile pharmacy that allows us to make, uh, custom medications for patients. And so I've been um, there, I've taken a tour and it's beautiful. It's incredible. I mean, you are seriously like walking into like a science laboratory yeah. and there's like all these safe rooms of like, you know, you, they step in and it cleans it and then you walk into it and it's, it's awesome, man. Yeah, I, I we walked had, in there. We have like, a, Holy moly, got a this is such a process. We've got a, a 22,000 square foot building in Houston, Texas and a 5,000 uh, square foot like pharmacy space with sterile room, um, 26 pharmacists and pharmacy techs on staff. Um, and all that was in an effort to one, drive the cost down and two provide better service because 
once our provider wrote a prescription and it went to CVS, like an example I can give you is you write a testosterone prescription and people are like, well, what's this going to cost me? Well, it kind of varies because at that point, the patient may want to use their insurance card. Well, insurance typically doesn't cover that. Mm -hmm. And what people don't realize when they go to a retail pharmacy, that also gets very uh, sticky because that pharmacy has contracts with your insurance yeah. company. And if they tried to charge your insurance or they've negotiated with Blue Cross to pay $135 for a bottle of testosterone, when you come in and yours gets denied, but you're a Blue Cross patient, and maybe you just don't have coverage on that particular medication because your unique plan, they are required by their contract with Blue Cross to charge you $135, right? So then it all falls apart again. Yeah. And so we realize we there's a better way. We have to build a facility. We have to manufacture these medications. We have to be able to provide patients with unique treatment options. And we've got to do it for pennies on the dollar. And so like for us, an example is a bottle of testosterone, I think is 80 something dollars. And that typically will last a patient two months. So, you know, for $40, they're getting what they would be paying $135 for at a CVS or a Walgreens. Wow. Well, man, for me, that's, I mean, you're taking, you just simplified so much. And that's, that's incredible, man, because it does feel like, I remember you sharing with me, I don't think it was a couple of weeks ago. It was probably more like a few months ago where you were at the pharmacy and you saw some girl like, so, I, I mean, upset that her insurance company used to cover. Do you remember this? Oh yeah. The medication yeah, yeah. that you last this month, was, they this covered was actually this. when I, uh, when I had COVID that they had sent me into the, uh, pharmacy to pick up meds. Yeah. Right. It was right after I had recovered from COVID. Right. And so, but you had to speak to her, right? Cause she couldn't understand. I just, yeah. That, the, that, 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 this was at a retail pharmacy, not revive. I was actually yeah, yeah. at a, in, I think in a Walgreens, uh, whichever ones they have in Randall's. Um, and I was at a grocery store pharmacy and the girl was berating the pharmacist okay. and was like, what do you mean? What do you mean? My medication's not fucking covered. You need to check the plan. My medication's covered. I just filled it last month. And the guy was like, ma'am, I'm sorry. Your medication is no longer covered from your insurance company. And so what a lot of people don't realize is those formularies, what they call an insurance formulary changes every like couple of months. So when I had a pharmacy, I would get a book, like a phone book. That's what the formulary of is? Everything that's not covered. That's not covered. And then insurance companies try to say, well, we didn't decide that the PBMs decided that, which is the pharmacy benefit manager. So there's an entity called a pharmacy benefit manager, just to give people a look behind the curtain. And that pharmacy benefit manager is who negotiates with all of the pharmacies across the United States on what medications will be covered and what medications are no longer covered effective the following month. But when you pull back the layers to the onion, who is the owner of the PBMs? It's no the idea. five biggest insurance companies. What? It's literally an entity set up that is run by the insurance companies. And those insurance companies get together and decide what they're going to cover. And obviously they're going to get rid of any more, any of the more cost uh, prohibitive treatments. And that's why less and less is getting covered. That's why a ketamine based pain cream, even though it's efficacious, it works. Uh, it was two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars a month. And you can't get high on it because it's going on your, <laughs> it's going on on your skin. Yeah, it's a topical. Yeah, and you can't lick it. I mean, it's like it's. And so they they wouldn't cover it because they could write an opioid for probably I think eight bucks a month or ten well, bucks a month. Why or is this legal? It yeah, it's why crazy. is this legal? Oh, that like question. I'm paying for insurance. Yeah. Why won't you pay for my well, medication? Now, I, I, I don't see that changing because you've got to realize there's some of the most powerful rich corporations in America. You're talking big pharma and big insurance. I mean, they're juggernauts. Yeah. Juggernauts. Yeah. And so, I mean, even when I owned a pharmacy example, I can give you is, and I won't say the carrier because I don't want to get sued, but I had a carrier. We had shipped out, we were a busy pharmacy. We had shipped out close to a million dollars in medications that month. And there was, long story short, our cost on it was about 300 something thousand dollars in medications. And the insurance company sent us the, the new PBM formulary and said, well, we're not covering, you know, $300,000 worth of these medications anymore. And we're like, okay, well, we already shipped them. Your patients have them. You know, you send us this report this month. Now you're going to backdate it to last month. And that's just how that system works. 
we were out the money. There's nothing and you could do about it. You threatened to sue, but then do I take a United Healthcare who made one hundred and eighty billion dollars, billion dollars in a year? Would I? Did you say one hundred and eighty billion dollars in yeah, one year? One hundred and eighty billion dollars. And your only uh, option, I think, last year was one hundred and eighty-eight. And your billion, only and option to get year. your only option to get paid what you did for your job to help their patients that yeah. are also paying them. Correct. Is you would have to sue them, and they've got the high, some of the highest, if not the highest, paid lawyers yeah. probably in the world. Yep. So what did that's, that do? That's the system. So you. So you, what did that you do? Fold oh, like, a, well, that's where I was like, man, we this retail space can't last. Like that's part of why I started between my personal journey of experiencing how bad the system was, and it taking so long for somebody to uncover my personal uh, deficiencies biologically to the waiting at that urology office for seven hours or whatever it was to get in with the guy to the terrible way he delivered the news to the short time of frame I had with him. If you look back and connect the dots, I felt like all of my life, I've just been preparing for this moment for, for ways to well, for if I didn't experience all that, uh, all those trials and tribulations, and never experienced what I had to overcome. Right. I never would have overcome and created ways to well. Yeah. And so it's a blessing. It is. Uh, it's a, it's a curse for the people who for are sure. still trapped I mean, in the yeah. matrix, yeah, 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 yeah. but if we can help those people break out of it. But for you personally, like it's, it's, it's having you me. pursue, it's prepared you to pursue a better way. Correct. To create a better way. For sure. And what do you think that is about you personally? Have you ever thought about this? Like, You've had to be so flexible. How many companies do you think you've started to get to ways to well? Because, and then then insurance shifts on you and then this and then this and then this. Yeah. And it's like, you have to pivot. It's just like in a fight. Like, okay, yeah. this is working. Uh oh, it's not working anymore. Yeah. Now I got to change it up. And I got to, I got to do this different, this fight. We've this probably era. had, man, four or five uh, iterations or, or I would say like components of ways to well that were like small little cornerstones that of other companies that had, have been successful and then failed. Like, I mean, I think, uh, last time you and I talked, you were asking me like one of the hardest challenges I've ever experienced other than losing my brother. And the answer is having to shut down a company, mm. having to make the difficult choice. I had a company, How many employees, 155 employees. Oh my God. And bro. we were scrambling in a, <clears throat> in a broken system, trying to adjust. This is when we were in the insurance model and one month, something dependent on insurance, paying Correct. you Correct. so that you could pay your employees. Correct. And then so you could take care of their patients, quit reimbursing on things or said, Oh, we're not going to cover that anymore. It's like, well, we built an entire ecosystem around the expectation that you were going to honor patients benefits and take care of your obligations. And now you're just going to tell us, no, sue us. And so it was, it was brutal. We had to go in and, and, and basically let go of, I, my biggest regret is I had already started building revive and ways to well to build a life raft for these people mm. because I saw the writing I knew. And I would go into the meetings. I say, guys, Hey, we're alive today. I don't know how much longer this is going to last. We're, we're ramping up these new companies. Here's why they're better. Here's why I'm excited. Here's the opportunity. We couldn't get those companies. We couldn't get them big enough in time to give all those people a life raft, unfortunately. And so it was brutal to sit there and have to let go of over 150 people, uh, wow. single moms, hardworking people who did everything right and deserved better. Yeah. Um, and that's the broken system we're in. That's and, the, that is the current healthcare system as an entrepreneur. And so wow. I just said, I got to get out of this. We're, we're not going to play in this sandbox anymore. And There's so right now, way. so right now you are not dependent and none of your patients are dependent at all on insurance or big pharma, which Correct. means we've cut out big pharma. We've cut out big insurance. We've cut out all the broken parts of the system. Which now it's us hand in hand with our patients who, and, and what's middle, crazy man. is if a patient comes through the ways to well program, you know, versus regular medicine, you know, it's mind blowing to them because they get 45 minutes with our providers. We do the deep dive. We go through all the analytics, all the data, but beyond that, behind the scenes, you know, the magic happens behind the scenes. Our providers meet every week. So we have mid levels, we have an MD. We have, uh, I think, 26 pharmacists and pharmacy techs on staff. We have over 55 employees and they sit in those meetings and they do deep dives and chart reviews and look at you. So it's not just 
uh, a nurse practitioner looking at your blood work. It's a nurse, a doctor, a pharmacist. What's the, what's Justin's treatment options? What do we have him on? Where are their areas of growth? Where are their areas of opportunity? I don't even think I knew that. Yeah. And that's, uh, but it makes sense because of the care is so good that it's like, there has been numerous sets of very skilled eyes that have expertise in different areas mm -hmm. that have put together my plan. And the only way to do that was to deviate from the broken system and do it, do it different to wow. reinvent it and, yeah. and go to a cash pay model. And I think at the end of the day, the patients could benefit, uh, the country could benefit. And the only one that loses is really big insurance. And, and they don't even lose because they're in reality still getting people to pay them for care that they're probably never going to no, render. God, that's <laughs> so crazy. Yeah. That's so crazy. It really is. Yeah. And I'm so grateful that you are who you are I, on that. Grateful for me, um, me being grateful for who you are. Tell me though, I remember you talking about letting people go and, and another time we're hanging out and I remember that you, you were, you were going to be, you know, giving people kind of, I don't know if you call it a landing strip or mm -hmm. some severance or some, some just opportunity to transition out of that. And you had to go to bat, um, for your people against some of the, maybe your counterparts. Yeah. At the, well, at the time, um, Can you with, share the, that with, story? with the previous company, I had two business partners and, uh, when we made the decision that it wasn't sustainable and we were going to have to fold up, um, we had a, a decent amount of capital in the bank account. And at that time for me, I felt like it was the right thing to do was to give people a cushion and a heads up. Mm. Um, and at the time, uh, the business partners wanted to just terminate everyone immediately, effective immediately. We're laying off and there's no, we're, there's no severance packages. Um, which I just, there's no, this was already a grueling and brutal enough experience. The last thing I was going to do was let down all these people who gave their blood, sweat and tears to us and worked their tails off. And so I basically said, Hey, I don't care what capital's left in the bank account. We're paying everyone out three months severance and we're going to give them a cushion to go find something else. Um, it was right at Christmas. It was December. Wow. By, by the time we finally folded, it was right. I mean, November, December timeframe is when we started laying people off. And we gave everyone three months severance packages, which totally wiped out a lot of the little bit of money that was left in that um, operating budget account. But I felt like at the time, that's the right thing to do. Of to course. Always try to try to find a way, no matter how hard, to do the right thing. So my buddy, Chris Long, the Super Bowl champ, he had a high school coach that I forget the, I forget the, what it's called, but I think it's called the man in the mirror. Uh, the, the, it's a, it's a poem called the man in the mirror and I would slaughter it trying to say it, but basically to sum it up, it is, you gotta be okay with the man in the mirror, right? At the end of the day. And I mean, if you would have just cut off 150 people immediately and say, see ya, and then just kept whatever money was left and you hadn't helped them before Christmas, Thanksgiving, all that other stuff. I well, mean, my view on it was if we did that, we're no better than big pharma. We're no better than big insurance. Whoa. We're out there just doing the same thing in a different way. And it's, I never got into this. It's, I, I didn't ever even had intentions of getting into this. It's just kind of evolved naturally. Um, and I, I want to do it different. I want to, I want to do right by people. And that was, that was the hope and that was the goal. And I feel like even when it's easy to do the right thing, when everything's going great. Yeah. Like the real test is, do you do the right thing when everything's going wrong and when it's a lot more painful to do it? I love that. Um, we're going to, we're going to, if, if I don't pull it up right now, I'm going to end uh, this episode with, with the man in the mirror that, um, that quote. And uh, because I want people to hear it and I would love for you to hear it too, man. So yeah. I'll send it to you because I remember Chris saying that, um, you know, even in high, it was his high school football coach and he had raised up like plenty of NFL players with plenty of people you'd never hear of that went on and did great things. And because of that quote and him drilling that into his players, you got to be okay with the man in the mirror, man in the mirror, man in the mirror. It was like, um, he said it felt like, I mean, this guy's won the Super Bowl twice, right? Mm -hmm. 
And he said that that little high school football locker room felt like you were getting ready to go play for the Super Bowl because you were just jazzing up so much. And I guess why even go off on that, that subject is because you can lay your head down at night and know that, that you're okay, that you, you did what What's you What's funny should. is you see it come full circle. One of the girls we had to lay off went out and started her own business. And now two years later to maybe th- almost three years later, she's leasing space from me in one of my buildings because her company's grown so much and she's what? doing so well. And she was so appreciative for how we handled a really bad situation. Um, she reached out and was like, Hey, I, I know you've got some available retail space with everything that's going on with COVID. Like, and I'm growing, I'm killing it and doing great. And I would love to like continue the relationship with you. And if you got space available, we'll move in. And so her company's uh, occupying space in one of the buildings, which wow. is awesome. Look at that. And this is somebody who went from it was a talk about overcoming. Yeah. Like they went from being laid off to, and it was the, it was a choice for her to decide, do I sit here and sulk or do I, or, or, or sulk or do I go out and like build something? And she yeah. built her own company and she's killing it. That it's is awesome. so awesome, man. It was, you, it was a springboard. Yeah. It was a springboard and it's not called the man in the mirror. It's called the man in the glass. I want to read this for you and for our yeah. listeners. The man in the glass, when you get what you want in your struggle for self and the world makes you a king for a day, then go to the mirror and look at yourself and see what that man has to say. For it isn't a man's father, mother, or wife whose judgment upon him must pass. The fellow whose verdict counts most in life is the man staring back from the glass. He's the fellow to please, never mind all the rest, for he's with you to... For he's with you clear to the end, and you've passed your most dangerous, difficult test. If the man in the glass is your friend, you can fool the whole world down the pathway of years and get pats on the back as you pass. But the final reward will be heartache and tears if you've cheated the man in the glass. And I mean, that's for me, when I read it and I hear Chris talk about it, some other people, I'm just like, Whoa, like don't cheat yourself, don't cheat others, don't mm-hmm. cheat yourself. And I think that going back, going back to where you said you looked at two two former partners and you said, No, that means we'll just be like big pharma. We'll be just like the insurance companies. The exact reason we started this to mm-hmm. be different. To be different. And um that just shows me your integrity and your heart and the kind of man that you are. Well, the beauty is it also was like a screening process for me with these previous companies. I got to see people's true colors and employees, Mm. true colors and who holds themselves to a higher standard. And at Wastewell, I I, I am so proud of the team we have because it is truly a team of people who care. Like every one of our providers care so much about the patients and everyone in that team behind closed doors is so passionate about what we're doing and what we're trying to bring to this space. Um, it's a breath of fresh air. It's amazing. Yeah, man, I love it. I love when I got to go up there and go on the tour. Any person I met there, I've, I've I mean, it's been incredible. Um, yeah. They've been great. <laughs> and uh, man, to train, I guess to transition from there, there is something that you've seen me going through and struggling with. And reason I say that is, um, you know, you say you see people's true colors, right? And one, and I read that poem, the man in the glass. And for me recently, it's been, it's been hard. Uh, it's been harder sometimes to look at the man in the glass myself Mm -hmm. because, um, I have a very similar struggle, obviously to your brother Preston that, that passed. And, um, I mean, I just want to beat this thing. And so I'm getting ready uh, to go to treatment, which is uh, a, a recovery treatment center, treatment recovery center uh, for drug rehabilitation, but also for some deep work and healing. But bro, there's been times that I've been around you um, intoxicated and uh, I've had a few stumbles around you and um you love me, you cared about me, all that stuff. But, but I just want to hear from you. You're, if it's okay to ask you, I know we're doing this live on the podcast yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but I want you to be really real mm-hmm. with me because 
I want to take this into treatment and to, to have a hard look at myself and look that man in the glass and see how I'm, I guess how I'm cheating myself whenever it comes to, I guess, who I, who I can be or should be uh, in those moments. Because like you've told me before, it's just like, uh, it's not, it doesn't, it seems like two different people, right? Mm -hmm. The guy that's using and me. So um, just know we can have a real heart to heart. There's yeah. no, nothing off limits right now. Yeah. Man, I love you. And I've seen the impact you've made in the world. Uh, you're one of the most selfless people uh, I've ever met. Probably the most selfless person I've ever met. You're a giver and you you made such an impact. And I know when we've had heart to hearts in the past, I've told you, I'm just thankful that you're here and above ground and healthy um, because I see what a change you're making in the world and how, even if it's just running into a stranger on the street who recognizes you from a podcast or your UFC career or as the big pygmy uh, or what you've done for all of the pygmies in Africa and the attention you've put on bullying, like you're making a difference in the world and it's important for us to help you stay healthy and focused. Um, and it's hard when, when I see you relapse, you're a different human. It's, it's not the same Justin Wren. It's not the big pygmy. It's a, uh, it's that drug. It's, it's, it's a much more, um, selfish, uh, <laughs> like, yeah. uh, almost, uh, oblivious. I, I don't even want to use the word selfish as much as it's almost like you lack awareness when you're using and you're, you're just totally different human being. It's, it's, it's sad because I'm like, I know the real Justin's in there, but it, it's, it's, it sounds messed up, but it's really easy to tell. I feel like when, when you start relapsing because you're just so different. Yeah, no, no, I, I, that's, what's so confusing to me because, um, and man, thank you. Thank you for being kind. And we can also, you know, it can be tough love and hard, hard stuff too. I invite that, um, or whatever it is that, that this, the rest of this conversation will be, but I don't want to do it. It doesn't make my life better. It doesn't like, I know, I know I'm, <laughs> I'm just talking out loud, but it's like, I don't want to be that guy. Yeah. And so it's hard to see on the outside too, because it's like, God, man, you got so much momentum and everything's going great. And you, you're training and, you know, I just, I was training with you at on it and it's like, a, and then it slowly starts to unwind and, and now training a little less and now maybe missing a podcast, uh, or whatever it is. And it starts to snowball and like, what was just a little snowflake becomes an avalanche. And then it's like, Oh God, here comes this avalanche of of uh, destruction and pain and suffering and anguish and all the things that come with you using. And it's hard because it's the exact opposite when you're not using the momentum. It's like a rocket ship. You feel like the energy and the passion and the drive, and you're just so motivated and helpful and inspiring and That's all great. of it. So I really do hope, I don't hope, I know you will overcome this. And I know that um, with help, and everyone needs help and it's important to not be afraid to ask for help. I wish my brother would have asked for help. I wish we would wow. have known. We didn't know that he was battling those demons because oftentimes addicts are so good at hiding it. Now, I, and to this day, I still struggle to say my brother was an addict. I, I would, I, I, I can't even say that he was, if he was, he was so great at hiding it. He, he definitely used, um, and I think he made poor choices, but it would be hard to say, from my seat to call him an addict. It's hard to say that. I don't feel like he was. Well, I think, I mean, not, not to I'm not saying your brother was an addict, but I think that a lot of addicts are so good at hiding it until they're not yeah. right. Yeah, until yeah. you've seen me. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and it's weird that these, um, you know, and I, I went to treatment the first time when, when, Went through divorce, COVID hit, lots of, lots, lots and lots of addicts um, were taken out because it was an excuse to use now working from home or nobody's watching or you don't have to go out and stuff. And I think that it took a lot of people out and it was, it wasn't until that, that I couldn't hide it anymore, I guess. I mean, I did, I, I, I came out of about at 23 and then I white knuckled it and then I found fight for the forgotten. And then all of a sudden all that passion kept me sober. Mm -hmm. And then I had some setbacks for sure over the years. So I'm not saying I was, I was perfect for a long time, but what I'm learning is this disease of addiction 
I'm not trying to give it an excuse like it's not a choice because it starts with a choice uh, or it did for me when I, well, I mean, I was given the Oxycontin and then it spiraled yeah. from there. And, but it's like, I think, I think it's hard because that's why I run. I mean, that's, that's why I run and use instead of let people see me most of the time until mm -hmm. like I'm trying to come out of the fog and then I have an obligation or something. And then, and then, and then we get together or mm -hmm. I think I can let my guard down for a moment with some friends or just a, actually most of the time not friends at all. And, uh, mm -hmm. and then it just, it just sneaks up on me in a way that it sneaks up on me. But at the same time, there's, there's been numerous times that I've used that I'm literally saying, don't do it. 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 And there's something in my brain that once the compound is in there that I feel like prioritizes it for survival. I mean, it literally above food, water, mm -hmm. sleep, any of the basic human needs. Yeah. And it's really confusing to me, man. So I'm really, I'm looking forward to, to, to going and trying to get some help for it. Not trying, getting the help for it. Love it. Pursuing the help. We're for here it. to help, man. Anything we can do. And uh, a, a healthy, happy Justin Wren is definitely a, a force to be reckoned with and somebody who's making an impact in the world. Thank you. Is there anything with um, that you see? I'm, I'm trying to see because uh, it's kind of like. I mean, I, I'm wearing the shirt and I, all of a sudden I flash to, to the Dustin Poirier, Conor McGregor shirt and I kind of um, flash back to that, that thing about karma and his saying was like, karma's not a bitch, karma's a mirror. Mm -hmm. Karma's not a bitch, it's a mirror. Mm -hmm. And so for you being such a good friend of mine um, and you knowing me and seeing me in those states that I don't even remember, right? Mm -hmm. Uh you can be a little bit of a mirror. Do you see any, I mean, well, you said no, that, that you didn't see Preston that way. Yeah. But if you could say something to Preston and I'm, the reason I'm saying this is, yeah, it can be to me, but it could be to someone else who's hearing this too. Yeah. But what, what would you, is there anything you'd want to say a, to him? I think or, a lot sure. of people, they lose hope and they feel like there's no hope. And, and a lot of times I, I learned this with, I, I feel like a lot of times when people commit suicide or overdose or, or make those mistakes, it's because they're in despair and they're in pain and they're in, and it may be emotional and maybe mental, maybe physical. And they, it's not that they want their life to end, it's that they want the pain to end. And there is help and there is help. And I feel like most loved ones aren't going to judge you if you, if you, if you are honest and doing your best to navigate something that's very difficult just be open and honest. Like that would be the biggest thing. I wish, I'm glad you've asked for help. I'm glad you've brought up <clears throat> and acknowledged that you have an, an issue. And I, all I wish for Preston is that we had that opportunity. And so if you're somebody out there struggling um, with depression or with substance abuse, don't be scared to rely on the people that are closest to you. Don't be scared to say, hey, I've been an asshole. I've been out of control and I know that I've done wrong. And I don't want to keep doing wrong and I'm, I want help and I'm willing to bet nine out of 10 times, those people are going to come running to help you. Yeah. You know, uh, I really want the listeners to hear that too, because I mean, I've, I've stacked some podcasts up together just so that I can go take care of myself. And, and honestly, like it, it I could have stopped this. I didn't, I didn't have to do these podcasts, but I thought that, um, it could be therapeutic and also part of my process. But also a way to be really open, honest, um, before I just dip off the grid. And then um, you're right. Whenever I started opening up, like I shared with Hot Pie and, you know, they came and round and supported Amy and I. Um, I shared with Onnit. They came around and said, we love you. Go take care of yourself. I shared mm -hmm. a fight for the forgotten. And, um, you know, the board's protecting fight for the forgotten. But at the same time, they're like, go take care of you and come back stronger than ever before. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I guess I like right before I came in here, um, you know, Jared Padalecki, uh, came over to the house. He was one of the guests on the show and he's an incredible human. And we got to hang out with him at a comedy show and, uh, him and I were in tears. I, I jumped in an ice bath before I came here to be on the podcast with you. And it's like, 
I, I'm, I've, I've gone to treatment before in the past and I didn't allow anyone to know before I went really, except for like a very small amount of people. Mm. And this time around, it's like, because I was open and honest about it, like people showed up to so show support and be mm-hmm. like, we want this. Um, I mean, we, we want to support you. And so that this is just to reiterate to other people. I'm very fortunate. I'm very grateful for all those people in my life. And I think a lot of times people have shame. They're scared to, they're scared to, they're scared to let people down. And I can tell you, nothing's going to let people down more than losing you. Mm. Like you, if you really are, if you're really worried about what other people think and what they feel in their life, then the best thing you can do is to be honest and ask for help. Because Mm. if you don't, it doesn't end well for anyone. It's, It's a brutal process. That, that just spurred something in me because I started thinking about this morning. I did a little meditation and, you know, cause I did a couple podcasts and I was thinking like, it was hard I was sweating. I was like, am I really talking about this on the show? And, uh, and I started thinking about the difference with like mold. <laughs> I know that sounds weird, <laughs> but, uh, I started thinking that mold is gross. Right. And for me, this, this substance abuse, this addiction to whatever substance is like this fungus, this mold, this thing that's just, and, and, and whenever I have that first one, it just spreads through my mind, my body. And, and, and I don't want it to affect the people around me, fight for the forgotten, all these things. Right. And in the dark, that's where fungus and mold thrives. Mm -hmm. But in the light, that's where mold barely survives. Right. And so Mm -hmm. by bringing this out into the light, I'm really hoping that I can, I can start to, to control this thing, shrink this thing, uh, kill this thing in the light by being open and honest. And if I kept it in the dark, I know, I know me because I've almost died twice of this, Mm -hmm. um, with two suicide attempts that this will kill me. It will, if I keep it in the dark Yeah, and if I bring it into the light and I ask for help, like that's, that's. That's the only shot I got. And, um, and so that's what I'm going to do. Um, anyways, that might be a weird word. No, that makes I, sense. I think it's a really good explanation. It makes total sense. Yeah. It's a good analogy. So I don't, I don't want to just, I don't want this thing to thrive and I don't just want to survive. I want to, I want to kill this, this thing. And I mean, I know it'll be a part of me that I have to main, main, maintain or maintenance the rest of my life and make sure that I don't get dark. But, uh, yeah, I got to overcome this and, uh, I'm going to. So, well, man, what else, what else have you, um, been up to? You're, you're a hunter. You, uh, have you been hunting at all lately? I know no, you've been shooting I'm, the bow. Uh, I'm actually going to go this next week, uh, with Tony and those guys for, uh, to do turkey hunt at a guy's ranch here in Texas. Cool. But yeah, I haven't really, uh, haven't gone in a while. It's been busy, been focused on the company. So yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Haven't, uh, but anything outdoors, I've been doing a lot when I have had free time, I've focused more on hiking and just getting out and being in nature. We've done a lot of hikes together here in yeah. Austin. There's some beautiful hikes and found some little gems of like rivers and creeks and swimming holes. It's been pretty cool. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Well, I can't thank you enough for being on the show, Brigham. And um, I guess do you have anything uh, you want to share? I mean, how can people find Ways to Well? Ways to Well um, dot <clears throat> com. Mm-hmm. Ways to Well, the number two. Number two. Uh, well dot com. And then we also have an Instagram, which is also Ways to Well. Um, and that's it. Everything's online. Uh, it's pretty transparent. You can register as a patient. And uh, everything's digital unless you're an out of state resident. And then we have, uh, the ability to treat you in person if you want to come on board. Well, that's really it. That's great. We try to make it easy and seamless. Yeah. It's pain, painless as possible. <laughs> painless as cost effective, yeah. easy on your pocketbook. And so people any, anyone who feels themselves. like that maybe they're, um, being let down by the system or anyone who feels like maybe they're not living their best life, feeling their best, um, low energy, uh, gaining weight, tired, lethargic. Yeah. Any, any of those things are telltale signs. You should wake up feeling phenomenal Mm -hmm. and don't let uh, a primary care provider tell you, uh, well, you're 40 years old. I mean, of course you're going to be more tired. Of course your sex drive is going to be less. That is them trivializing your pain and your suffering 
And that doesn't have to be the case. Uh, that's just not the case at all. Yeah, man, that's, that's so good. I, I actually just started finding out that, um, like on all this stuff, like everything works together, like, mm -hmm. like, uh, and so I found out that dairy, did you know this, that dairy is actually really bad for an opiate addict? No, and I the, didn't know that. Yeah. And dude, I I'm love sure dairy. the providers. You know, Denise you, probably knows, you know but I didn't. Yeah. It's what's crazy is I've been eating a lot of Jenny's ice cream uh, and then it's the best ice cream in the world That's hilarious. before this uh, <laughs> relapse. And, uh, and I was drinking a lot of milk and I mean like stuff that I don't need, mm -hmm. but, um, and I eating a lot of cheese, even though I, most of the time, and that's, that's, that's something that I see in my relapses that, uh, it, it's kind of crazy. Like I might go to food first, right? Cause I'm a heavyweight. I grew up a fat kid. Mm -hmm. I go to food first and then, um, but anyways, in the stomach, uh, what milk and dairy does is it combines with some sort of stomach acids and it basically makes some sort of compound that is in the family of like morphine. Mm -hmm. And from that, you can start getting cravings for oxy and other opiates and things like that. To, so this is crazy. And what I love about this is I have a lot of the ways to well stuff. And now I'm about to have, um, I'm about to have the stuff from treatment. I'm going to be able to pair that and come back armed and be able to share with ways to well that, Hey, here's, Here's what I need for my recovery, right? And because you guys got me getting so optimal health wise, yeah. And then uh, I'm really, really excited. So, anyways, went off on a little tangent there, uh, off, right. off on the side. But I love you, man. You are. I, I'm the only child. Uh, you're, you're a brother, and I'm so grateful to have a brother like you in my life. And we're here if you need us. We're always here, and we love you. Yeah, love you too, my man. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you for being on. And uh, remember those out there listening, you have overcome a hundred percent of your darkest days. And now I want to invite in you some more light into your life. Why don't you go try ways to well, give it a look, give it a gander, because that was my lighthouse. That was what gave me a lot of hope. And so if you're struggling with anything physically, give them a shot. Thanks guys. All right. Thanks. Wow. Thank you so much, Brigham Bueller, for being with us on Overcome with Justin Wren. Thank you guys for being here. It was, uh, it was fun. Brigham is one of the most special friends and people uh, that I have in my life. So I'm really grateful that he came on the show today and just poured his heart out. It was so real, even about the hard loss of um, his brother, Preston, and about the difficulties that he's had to overcome to create the businesses, revive pharmacy here in Texas, and also uh, ways to well. And I hope you got a lot out of that. And I know that uh, it, it, it might be a little awkward. It was a little awkward for me having to talk about my relapse. Coming up will be uh, Dr. Daniel Amen, my doctor, 12-time New, New York Times bestselling author. And uh, I'm going to do a live therapy session with him probably on the next episode releasing. And after that, we'll get to my boxing coach and my sponsor, Jeffrey Meadows, my sponsor in recovery, meaning he's, he's like my, my recovery advocate, my coach. Uh, also in that, not just in boxing, but in the fight against the substance abuse and mental health and addiction um, that I'm looking at. So these are unique episodes. I've never done anything like this in my entire life. Uh, I've tried to be very open and honest but I hope that this is a, a new level of that um, because it's what's going to keep me well. Just like in this podcast, we're talking about what are those ways to well. I think it's uh, being able to bring it out into the light and, um, and talk about it. If this is something that impacted you, if it uh, would help somebody else, uh, please share it out. I hope that this podcast really becomes one of the most meaningful podcasts in the world, meaning we talk about real issues real struggles, real challenges that we all have to overcome. You might know someone struggling with their healthcare journey, like someone that Brigham helped that's been on a feeding tube for three years and is now uh, able to eat again. Uh, and this might encourage them. So, so please equip them with Brigham's story and the company Ways to Well. If you know someone that's been struggling through substance abuse, um, addiction, uh, mental health, depression, things like that, um, and my story might encourage them. Please share that out with them. 
but you can also like or follow, rate, review, subscribe to the show. And, uh, and that helps us out and helps us get this into the hands of others with more resources um, that, that hopefully can help them. And so I am taking a little bit of a step back. Uh, actually, I'm taking a huge step back this next 30 days, maybe longer. I'm going to stay there as long as I need to. I guess another reason I'm doing this podcast is accountability. Can't really release a podcast that I'm going to treatment and then not go. I'm fully committed to me, but uh, it just adds that extra layer of accountability by letting Hot Pie know, On It know, uh, Fight for the Forgotten know, and now letting you know uh, that I'm, I got to go do this. I got to go do it for me, not for the listeners and not for Fight for the Forgotten, although I mean, that's, that's great motivation. It's a huge reason, but I got to want this for myself. And I've kind of come to that realization. I've known that, but it's time to go get some deep work in therapy and see what these root issues are and how to protect myself from this happening again, because I do want to live the life that I'm created for. And I know you do too. So, uh, we all face challenges and, um, sometimes we need to ask for help. I hope that uh, whatever you're going through, whatever challenges there are, just like if someone came to you and asked you for help that you love, you'd probably drop everything and help them, right? So uh, if you're in a place where you need some help, like I am right now, uh, reach out, look for some therapy, uh, look for some resources, look for a meeting in your area for recovery or a treatment center um, or you know, in your healthcare journey, look at, look, look to companies like ways to well, ways to wells here in Texas. Um, but, but they'll be there for you. People want to help. That's at the core of every human heart is wanting to help our fa- uh, fellow man. So thanks so much for listening. These next, uh, three or four episodes of the podcast, I think are going to be really good, but I'll be honest. They were, uh, they were pretty uncomfortable at times. So, uh, I hope that this is a, a, a blessing to you. I tried to lean in tried to be real open and honest. And so thanks for being here, guys. I'll see you guys in a month or two or three. We'll see. Thanks. Hey, don't forget to send your overcome stories to overcome at gmail.com. And also rate review, subscribe and follow overcome with Justin Wren.